The life of Jesus Christ, when we have it, we receive the same quality. We receive the same quality. And even what is even more amazing than receiving the same quality of life is that we should receive the same quantity to receive a, a life called eternal life. But e eternal life is a synonym or ageless life or endless life is a synonym for the life of God. There is no eternal life outside of the life of God. It is God's life, in other words. He gave us his Holy Spirit, which is also equivalent to the spirit of holiness, but everybody's got their own religious ideas and they want it their way. They want it their own way. They want to interpret it based upon what they believe. I want things to be not what God believes. God has made very clear what he believes. A cursory review of the Bible isn't going to get the job done because it has absolutely no indication of hunger and thirst. A cursory review of the Bible, just an overview of the Bible. And even when, a, when there is an intense investigation, doesn't necessarily really truly mean that there's hunger and thirst there. There could other be other motives. I have Orthodox Jewish friends, Haradim, Hasidim, others of different sects in Judaism. They know the Bible better than any Christians that I know but they don't have the life of God. They've never received the life of the Spirit. Christians on the other side of the coin, modern day Christians, they basically, I mean, they're just flying by the seat of their pants. And if they basically treated as it were the evaluation of the Word of God and the will of God, if they treated their jobs or their other interests or their academics pursuits on the same level of investigation, they would be absolute utter failures. The reality of it is, dear people, is we sit in a situation here in Southern California where the atmosphere is charged by the, by the prince and the power of the air, the God of this world, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. And I'm afraid, I'm concerned that God's people are being overrun by the influence of the spirit of disobedience. The question is, do you have the spirit of obedience? The question is, do you have the spirit of obedience? I listened to as a man pointed out the other day um, how that the secular, secular community, the secular, I didn't say Christian, I said secular, how the secular community was in uproar when Gone with the Wind was published. When Gone with the Wind became a movie for everybody to go to the movie theaters and watch, there was a word in there that caused a great uproar 70, over 70 years ago in the secular community and it was the word damn. One word, secular community had an uproar. Today, the Christian community is worse off than the secular community was 70 years ago. Hello? Because deception has no end and compromise ultimately totally re re results in complete and total imprisonment. Huh? A little bit of an agreement with the tyrant will ultimately result in you being completely taken over to live under a tyranny. And what God's got to have is God's got to have some people that are willing to come apart and be separate from the things that are going on in this world. Because they're, unless you will, you're going to go down a pathway that you're not going to be able to understand which turn in the road to make. You're going to go, or you're going to begin to chart a course that there's impossible for you to navigate. One compromise will be met, met with another compromise, one justification with another justification until the whole mess is just so distorted that you can't even make a difference between ultimately good and evil. And we are there in that state right now, believe you me. We cannot make the difference or discern the difference between the will of God and the will of Satan, the mind of Christ and the mind of demon powers. And believe me, we there, we're there. What we, do, what we know is that we, most people have never been willing to step in to a place where the Holy Spirit overwhelms them. They live in this manifest glory. They go from, they go from a happy state when they get you know, into a realm where the Spirit of the Lord is moving to, to their sad and sorrowful state. They let emotions go into their life and inspirations and influences and motives toss them back and forth. They have no restraint against their own sadness. They have no restraint against their own sorrow. They have no restraint against their own bad attitudes and bad feelings, much less those that would be imposed upon them by the God of this world. And it's time you shape up. And let me just tell you about the shape that God would like for you to have to be conformed to the shape of the Son. 
to the image of Jesus Christ. It's time for you to shape up. Somebody said, well, what am I going to do? I mean, I just don't know what to do. Well, the Holy Ghost has come to shape us. <laughs> He's come to mold us. God came and molded us. He showed us how man get, men get started with him. He took us from the fine dust and he, and he shaped us. He shaped us. I know, I know evolution. I know the theories of evolution better than you do. I know the theories behind evolution and, 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 and the ideas of, of physics that would ultimately bring people to a conclusion that God didn't shape us. I know them better than you do, more than likely. And I'm going to tell you right now, there is none of that based upon any sort of reproducible evidence, but I am a quantifiable data point for everything that the Bible says being true. And I know that this is reproducible thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times over and over again in every generation, every, every, every year of every century, every century of every millennium. Hallelujah. Right. You show me one example of any kind of vertical evolution. Show me one. There's not, it's not singularly not an example. Somebody said it all happened. That, well, if it all happened, then why isn't it still happening? And then you're going to hear some kind of yarn on that, and then people just buy into it. Hook, line, and sinker. Why? God of this world demands it of you. You're under tyranny. It's not logical. It's not sensible. And I work with some of the foremost scientists in genetics when I worked for Eli Lilly. And, um, you know, and it, it was a common little joke. You know, it's just the idol of today. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's our new totem pole. And it really is. It's just the idol of the day. It's the new to the totem pole that everybody bows down to and shows respect and reverence to. I'm, I'm, and I just have to stop and say that because when I start talking about being shaped in the image and the likeness of God, the spirit of this world will intercept that and try to block that view. So people can't even move forward even under the fundamental notions and very fundamental truths of which we know we exist by in which we know God interacts with us on the basis of. There's no anointing for the deer this morning. There's no anointing for the turtles and for the sharks of the sea. There's no anointing for the birds. There's no anointing for the camels and for the crocodiles. But there's an anointing for you. There's no anointing for the bunnies hopping around out there. They're doing their thing. But there's an anointing for you. And that anointing is the very life of God. That's something you step in, out, step in and out of. Come on now. It's the realm of life. It's the realm of God's goodness. It's uh, my, the abundant life, the goodness of God's life. They wanted me the other day, they wanted me to, they interviewed me, wanted me to talk about alcohol in the church. And they wanted me to get into a big theological thing. I said, look, let's just set all that aside. aside. Let me talk camera. Look at the camera and said, listen, I just want to ask you a question. Why do you need to get high? Why do you want to get stoned? Why is it that you're so absent of this goodness of God's life that you need a substitute, that you empty on the inside and you want to try to find a way to justify drinking alcohol in the Bible? You can't take something that is, is known to be bad and make it good. You can never make a wrong right. You can't. So give me a break. The day the evidence is in. But yet, but yet you know what? People and justify this. I mean, goodness gracious. To know tomorrow. Though the sociologists would tell you the evils of it. The psychologists would tell you the evils of it. The medical scientists would tell you the evils of it. Oh, no, 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 no. They said that it was good for us to have a good... good. Look, it's poison to your body. It's, your, it's poison to your body. It's poison. Ethanol, alcohol is poisonous to your body. The Lord says this, he said, don't be intoxicated with wine because it will produce a life of debauchery. Mm -hmm. Now make that good. Make that good. Make Jesus doing it. Nonsense. 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 But rather be filled with the Spirit. The reality of it is that when we say filled with the Spirit, we're talking about filled with the life of God. We're talking about a life that's going to make the difference of where you spend eternity. 
A life that's going to make the difference of whether you spend eternity in heaven or hell. Somebody said, I'm a good person. I'm not, asking, I'm not interested whether you're not good, a good person or not. I'm sure you are. Bless your heart. I'm, I mean, my, you may be the most wonderful person on the face of the earth. I'm asking, do you have the life of God? That's all. I'm asking, do you have the life of Jesus? I'm not asking you how good you are. I'm not interested in how many good deeds you've done. I'm not interested in how many orphans you've taken care of, how many poor people you've fed. I'm not interested so much in that. I'm not interested in how many millions of dollars you help to, to raise for, for just causes. I'm interested in whether or not you have the life of God, you have the life of Jesus Christ. Because once you have it, you don't want any other life. You're hungry for this life, and where you find the absence of this life, you won't allow it. You'll have nothing of it. You won't have it. Listen, people aren't going to allow robbers and thieves in their houses. They're not going to allow rodents and roaches in their houses. They're going to get an exterminator. They're going to get new locks and alarms and systems to keep the thieves and the robbers out to stop the rodents and the roaches. Give me a break. Lay down and have to sweep your bed off of all the rodents and whatever else that's there, and the spiders, and my goodness. You're not going to live like that if you're right in the head. You're with me. Third world people, I've been living in third world countries. I've been, they don't, they understand that. They're not going to put you in a bed with a bunch of spiders. They did their best to kill them all before you come into the room. And trap all the rodents so that you don't have to, you know, entertain pets through the night. And what am I saying? I'm saying, I'm, I'm talking about the spiritual dynamics of what people allow in their lives. What they allow to room in their thoughts and their minds and their thinking. What they allow upon the countenance of their face. What they allow in the atmosphere of, of, their, of, of their everyday life. People, God has given to us the opportunity of an amazing life that you, religion cannot describe to you, cannot have it through religious means. Somebody said, well, I believe that God is a humanist. And if, and God, first of all, God's not a humanist, but that's really a very interesting concept that God would be a humanist when he's God because there's nothing human about him. But at any rate, God is a humanist and that he's never going to send good people to an eternity uh, called hell. No, good people choose to go into an eternity called hell. Huh? Because with God, hate and suspicion, talking things about other people as bad as murder. Now, I know that isn't on your scale. I know that isn't on the legal system scale. My goodness, everybody would be in prison on death row if it was that way. <laughs> if, 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 if hating people and, 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 and talking evil against your neighbor and being suspicious and, 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 and being slanderous, if, my, if that was on the same scale as murder is, it might be in prison. There'd be nobody to keep the people in the prison and take care of them. But with God, it's the same. Hate and murder is the same with God. No difference. I said hate and murder is the same with God. There's no difference. Huh? With God? Strife and envy comes out of the same demonic realm as adultery and homosexuality. With God? Same demon power. It's not God choosing men to go to hell. He chose for all men to be saved. God's long-suffering. This is good news. God's long-suffering. He's going to say, I know you violated everything about my life. I know that you're everything opposite of me, but I'm making a way now for everything to be cleansed and everything to be washed away and everything to be made new so that you can come now and enjoy my kind of life. And there's a lot of people who say, I don't want that kind of life. I like my own life. See, those who sat in great darkness, suddenly the light sprang up. Suddenly those who dwelled in the shadow of death saw the light of life. But guess what? Men love darkness rather than life because they love evil. And you're going to have to decide whether or not you're one of those, which people you are. Because I'm going to tell you right now, when you choose to walk with God, all in heaven comes to your aid to enforce God's divine will against the powers of darkness so that they cannot live or execute tyranny over you. And furthermore, all heaven comes to your aid to support you, to stand alongside of you. And furthermore, God the Holy Ghost himself comes to be your teacher and your mentor so that you can be an expert at walking in the ways of God. 
One amen, two nods, two head shakes, three, and the rest of everybody else is stunned, shocked out of the mind. What am I going to do with this? What, what, what department do I put this in? Are you with me? Think about it. I'm going to tell you why you get so shocked, because as I say it, the compromises of life begin to impact you. Those who are crying out, saying, oh God, hey, this America is about to change, unfortunately. It's about to change. Your money's going to be taken from you. You know, the beautiful model of just-in-time manufacturing, just-in-time supply chains are about to reveal their weakness. Just-in-time manufacturing and just-in-time supply chains means that the supply chain is interrupted. It only takes a matter of hours for everything to be shut down for a long span of time. Then what are you going to do? Pastor, pray for me. I haven't eaten for four days. So what are you going to do? Pastor, pray for us. The water in our neighborhood is ridden with various different pathogens. And infectious agents, other infectious agents, and parasites. What are we going to do? How are we going to, how are we going to move into faith now to see food multiplying, see contaminated water purified? People sit around and say, it ain't going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And no one's prepared. And it's just the, same way for the, just the same way for the coming of the Lord Jesus. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And no one's prepared. Few are prepared. It's going to be a day of great calamity. They're going to, everybody's going to be saying, how can this even be taking place? This can't be taking place. Goodness gracious. How? Come on. Government, I thought you were taking care of us. Well, who's taking care of them? I just walk in the halls of Congress and walk in the halls of Senate. There's a desperate look on every one of those guys' faces. I don't see anybody walking around with a great confidence. There's a, great, there's a look of desperation. There's a look of great concern. There, there are a lot of people. There's a lot of not just, not just, you know, some fringe guys that just got in there elected by tea party. There's people going, what are we going to do with this situation? The financial situation, if everybody understood it, they would be... They would be tilling up their backyard and getting, getting it, uh, you know, ready to be able to grow something. And you gotta, you're going to have to fast for a couple months. And hopefully it's the right time of year. And in San Diego, you got so many bugs and stuff and varmints inside the ground. Bless your heart. I don't think that thing's going to grow. And how much food are you going to grow out of your potted little whatever? Huh? Now your little, come on. Huh? Jesus, help us. Sudden calamity comes upon people. Oh, it's not all that bad. Sorry to say it's worse. Rather, well, let's not think about it right now. Let's not think about it. You know, I said a number of years ago, I started telling people, I gave them the statistics of how many people live on government aid. Whether everything from pensions, okay, to some form of social security, to some form of welfare. The percentage, and then it's the percentage right here in San Diego of people that live based upon what the government paycheck will a be able to do on a weekly basis. That's the first thing that goes in financial chaos. So I, well, I, don't start telling us that. We came here to feel good. I, I'm, I'm, here to, I'm, I'm here not to make you feel good. I'm here to make you think about where your life is at and where you're going with your life, okay? I'm here to tell you that God has made a way of escape so that you do not have to go from one destruction and one chaos and one problem to the next. And I'm most, most important to me of all is I'm here to let you know that heaven is worth going to and hell's worth missing. And believe you me, you must be determined if you're going to make heaven and miss hell. And I'm telling you, you don't have to be determined on your own because God is so determined. He made a way of escape for us that is absolutely amazing. God is long-suffering, not willing that anybody perish. He wants everyone to come to this knowledge of salvation. But it is true indeed salvation. It is truly deliverance. Jesus came and delivered me. He came and saved me from demonic... the demonic powers that ruined and run and controlled my life. 
John said, he that sins is of the devil. First John chapter three, verse seven, he that sins is of the devil because it takes demon spirits to sin. Anytime you sin, you participate with the demon spirit. Somebody said, well, if you run a red light, is that sinning? No. It is one of two things. Either it took you by surprise or you are not thinking properly. And I wanted to say idiot, but I'm trying to be careful with that word. <laughs> because somebody coming from the other direction is going to hit you and you're going to die. You're going to get hurt real bad. In fact, it'd be better to die than to be paralyzed because you got, you know, I want them to say it. You get run over by a Mack truck or whatever. Stop at the red lights. It's not an indication of demonic powers, it's an indication of another S word, stupid. <laughs> not Satan, stupid. Not demonic, dumb, right? But let's get to the real point. Let's get to the real point. Is watching television and lusting after that design that is really the hook for movies sin? Absolutely sin. Yes, sir. Absolutely under demonic influence. It's called lasciviousness. Did God choose that for you? No, you chose that. And Father's just simply not going to have the ways of demonic power in his presence. It just can't mix. You're not going to have, you know, God has brought us into the privilege of being able to live in the realm of the day. I love the day. The only thing I even like about night is the light that you can see. Let me say that again. The only thing I even like about nighttime is the light that you can see, like from the stars and the moon. That's all I like about the night. Take that away. I don't, want, I don't like nothing about the night. Huh? Because I belong to the day. I live in the realm of the day. And people want to walk around and say, they want to walk around in their religious notion and say, I am of the day, but they live in the night. They say, I am of the light of this world, but they love darkness rather than the light of this world. So I'm just here, I'm here to make you, I'm here to, I'm here to push you. I can't make you do anything. I'm here to push you to think. Huh? I'm here to push you to deal with the reality of your life. Not in the context of how Karl Marx defined it or how Andrew Jackson defined it or how the early formers of our Constitution defined it or how Socrates defined it or how Philo defined it or Plato defined it or your favorite philosopher defined it, but how God defined it. How God defined it. It is amazing to me how many people know, judge not that you be not judged, but they don't know all who do these acts of iniquity have no part in the kingdom of God. I think you should know both. Yes. Because when I get declare to you the judgments of God, I'm not judging. I'm just, the, I'm just the messenger. I had a person come out to me the other day and tell me I couldn't do something that I thought I should be able to do. I had my university warm-ups on instead of, you know, slack. So they said I couldn't go out to the driving range. I said, you know, there's no one out there right now. Could I sneak past and just hit a few balls? No. And so I realized, no, I might as well not say anything. She's just the messenger. No, I could stop. I'm not going to argue with her. I could stop and ask her if I could talk to the management for just a few minutes. But I can't, I can't condemn her for judging me. Are you with me? I can't condemn her for creating a dress code and then establishing the rules of golf, e golf ethics. She's the messenger. You can't say that because I'm declaring you the judgments of God that I'm judging you. Or that if anybody comes and declares the judgments of God that they're judging you. They're declaring to you the judgments of the Lord which are true and righteous altogether. And you can say they're not true and you can say they're unrighteous, but I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to lose the argument. 
God has already established the divine order long before you and I were born, long before anything ever existed. And you are going to be able to supply some new information that would cause them to reevaluate. I'm hoping that you get this. This, and I'm going to tell you where the world's going. They're going to decide everything about God. He's alien. And they're going to treat him just like they treat aliens on all the new alien movies. We don't like him. He doesn't have the right to come tell us what to do. And we're going to throw off his restraints. And we are going to remove his bands from off of us. And we're going to get everybody together. And we can go fight against him. It's called Armageddon. And never has the world ever been in such social disorder that you could picture that actually happening by humanity. But now you can see it more plain than ever before because a humanistic, socialistic agenda that has been so advanced within the very framework of the way people think, not just the culture, it's the way they think. I mean, yeah, you could say that culture is a reflection of the way people think or they're being conditioned to think, but truly this is very, it's almost like you could say it's, it's in the DNA <laughs> at this juncture of time. Think about it. God's not going to tell me what to do. I, I disagree with all of those things about the Bible and then come up with this argument. How do you know that's what God said? Because we absolutely certainly know it. Can you prove it? Yeah, I can prove it. That's a very neat, that's a very wonderful thing of the mercies of God. We can prove God's word. Huh. Having been raised in scientific community and scientific analysis, ultimately when you hear something, the first thing you're supposed to do is disprove it. It can't be. And if you cannot disprove it, then it's probably true. Huh? And I don't have a problem with that analysis. I don't think that's the best way to go. I think, it, I think it's far better for you just to behave yourself like a little child because more than likely you don't have enough time to prove one way or the other. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if you just open up your heart just a little bit, God will flood you with so many proofs. My goodness. Amen. You'll be a witness and a personal testimony and personal data point that everything the Bible said is true. Hallelujah. Because God can't lie. And if one part's true, it's all true. It's all right. If Jesus came, lived, was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the world celebrates that event. Nobody's going to have an excuse on that day. Say, we didn't understand. The Lord's going to look at you. How many Christmases did you have? How many, how many Easter's did you celebrate the resurrection? How many opportunities in America have you had in Europe to hear the, the announcement of the gospel of Jesus Christ? In fact, even in places in the Middle East and in Asia where there's a lockdown and being able to say anything about Jesus at all because they want to promote their deity deities and also because they have convinced the people that for anybody to minister anything about Christian Christianity is just an attempt to subvert the government and westernize them another one of Satan's big lies but nonetheless back to my point when it's Christmas time you get to preach the gospel because everybody knows pretty much about it everybody knows about Christmas I have not found someone so far back in the dark jungles or so far removed in the isolated deserts of the Middle East that they haven't heard about Christmas. <laughs> have you heard about Christmas? Do you know what Christmas is all about? Do you? Have you heard about Easter? Yeah, you have. Do you know what it's all about? It's about that God came for the sole purpose of liberating us, of delivering us from this present evil world. Delivering us from being under the ruination of humanism and demonism. Humanism was inv invented and authored by Satan himself. Men have lived in a prison by choice, by choice. 
your leaders, your governors, the people who've authored your life in a human world. You know, you say, oh, you know, I'm my own thinker. You're not your own thinker. If you're your own thinker, my goodness, it'd be a terrible looking thing. I'm, not te I'm telling you the truth. Be absent of all education. Be absent of all, of all you know, the, the influences in your life. And then what are you going to look like? You're going to look like whatever you were around. If you were around the tigers and the bears, you're going to look and act like the tigers and the bears. Are you with me? If all you had was trees and birds, you're going to sound like a bunch of birds. And you may act like trees from every once in a while. I don't know. I, but the bottom line of it is you're a product of your culture. You're a product of your social, uh, your, your social community, your, your sociology. Your, psycho, your psychology has been imposed upon you. That's your own thinker. It's nonsense. God came with the message of liberation to liberate people psychologically, socially, emotionally, physically. No one has overthrown his word. Time only validates it. Time only validates it. Science does not overthrow God's word. It's at one, one, one century after the next century of investigation only validates it. It's just that every once in a while somebody gets tripped up with a, with a concept like Darwin espoused and it takes about 300 years to show that it ain't right. Huh? It's no coincidence that Darwin and Karl Marx were contemporaries with each other. It's no coincidence. No. I can show you through history. There's waves of insult against humanity. It happened. It doesn't happen just speckled. There's events. There's events. There's events. Karl Marx empowered Darwin to be able to think like he did, and empowered the world to accept it. And so, like, likewise, Karl Marx, I mean, Darwin empowered Karl Marx and the world. I could go on and on. I'm not here to do that here today. It's too much, too complicated. You won't sit here that long. You got other interests. You want to go listen to Barney Miller? Forgive me for being insultive. It just, it does, it does get reduced to that level. Go listen to CNN, spin for you what's really not going on. When, uh, when we were in school, when we were an undergraduate, we had a teacher, a lawyer, who was our history teacher, Dr. Kirkamo. Wasn't that his name? It was Kirkamo, wasn't it? He said, I want to show you what goes on in your newspaper. He takes the San Diego Tribune. He said, I want you to, here's your assignment. Tell me how much of this is fact, how much is opinion, and how much of it's inference. It was a sad situation. It was a moment of great discovery. You take 1% fact, you build 90% opinion around, 9% 9, 9 opinion around that, and then 90% inference where you explode this thing and spin it to whatever you want it to spin. And everybody's going, wow, did you hear about what happened? <laughs> CNN, Fox, I thought it was a great thing that Fox should be, that CNN should be owned by Fox. They're already owned by the same corporation really anyways. But have the same name and entity. And then everybody could just try to figure out who they belong to. <laughs> because Fox is telling the truth and CNN's not and not. If you believe that, I got some swamp land I'd like to sell you. <laughs> Come on, people. I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm not trying to be a person that's, you know, against everything. I'm just telling you. It should be obvious at this point that folks around you aren't telling you the truth. Huh? It should be obvious to everybody that things really aren't the way you thought they were when you first started with it, whatever that it is, our program was. But God's word is forever settled in heaven. What he said is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for you to disprove one jot or tittle of it. Somebody says it's not true, the burden of proof is on your side. Prove that it's not true. <laughs> one, one point of it, prove it's not true. Come on now. Well, if God's true and he's not a liar, what are you going to do about the things he says concerning your everyday existence and the way you live and the way you think? 
There are so many people who hold on to the way they think. They're not interested in being conformed to the mind of Christ. They're not desperate. They've not had a moment of reality to shake them that the way they think is wrong. The way they behave, their own human pursuits is, is distorted. It's warped. And it's going to lead them to destruction unless they get a hold of the reality of God. They've never come to the point of awareness. They've never had that encounter with God enough to recognize, wait a minute, I don't want to think like this anymore because the way I think ultimately determines the way that I'm going to act. And that's going to determine the way that I'm going to live. And I'm interested in the life of Christ. Therefore, I've got to be willing to start thinking differently about the way I'm going to act so that I can live in a whole other realm. And then all of a sudden you get to this point, you recognize, wait a minute, I'm powerless to think different on my own. I'm just a product of all the stuff and all the events and all the education and all that's been imposed upon me from my birth. How is this going to change? God comes, works a miracle. It's a miracle to change. God opens up our eyes to see a whole nother world, a whole nother realm. A whole, he opens up our eyes to see a whole nother reality. Reality is defined by the truth that you ascribe to, by and large, from a personal perception. I'm not talking about in reality. Are you with me? I'm not. In reality, reality cannot be changed. Okay? <laughs> truth is absolute truth. It can't be altered by individual perceptions. What happens is somebody comes along, has just a little bit more perception about things and observation powers than others, and he's a genius. And lights are created. <laughs> and medical breakthroughs take place. Huh? New unique understandings of the physical nature of the world is un unveiled. Just because somebody had a little bit more perception about what's really going on than others. Are you listening to me? Huh? But now let's talk about our individual perceptions about how we've been being treated and how we've been being taken care of and what we believe to be truth. Huh? Then that's ultimately, people, going to be something that is going to bias you and it's very, very subjective. And you read a little bit of this and you read a little bit of that and you think a little bit of that and, and think about it, a little bit of the other thing and ascribe a whole bunch of different stuff and come up with your own ideas. Man, I'm a genius. I figured it all out. This is the way it works. This is what I think. Okay, well, fine. You better be right because your eternity's now weighing on your shoulders because you're going to go with what you think and that might, that probably, that's not going to work out for you. I migrated from might, I think, to absolutely certain. It's not going to work out for you. Father in his love and his mercy gave us the word, Christ Jesus. Amen. What is the word? It's the definition. What is the word? It's the revelation. What is the word? It's the unveiling. What is the word? It's the proofs. What is the word? It's the understanding. Before I vote, I'm going to read about the guy who's running. I say, you read. I'm glad you read. Probably not true. Huh? Well, not all of it at any rate. I'm sure his name is what he said his name was. I'm sure his birth date was what he said his birth date was. Or hers. And then based upon whether or not it lines up with whatever it is that you ascribe to, that you believe is going to change the world or going to secure your freedoms and liberties and assure your right to happiness or some, some kind of happiness. I haven't seen too many real happy people lately. Have you? Have you really seen a lot of really happy people driving down I-5? Have you seen a lot of happy people in the stores lately? Have you seen a lot of just, just jubilant, just so, wow, just look at the lettuce. I mean, you know, we're just so thankful that our, that our grocery store here in our community is just, you know, just jam-packed with all of this healthy, rather than like poisons and, and, and contaminants and fertilizers and where's the organic section? Now the organic section is bad. Not a lot of jubilant, happy people. Everything, somebody forgot pursue, pursuing happiness. <laughs>
What if you just did that? What if you just pursued happiness from this day forward? Pursued happiness. Well, it's probably going to happen if you just left to yourself. Then you're going to pursue happiness trying to get what you think is going to make you happy. And if you should happen to be able to be, to be insightful enough and intelligent enough and skillful enough to actually get whatever it is that you wanted that you thought would make you happy, then you get there to discover that it didn't make you happy. It can't make you happy. And now you're saying, okay, we're going to have to start over because that didn't work. I'm here to talk to you about the life of Jesus Christ to make you happy. So I said, well, oh, hey, let's talk about that for just a minute. I haven't seen a lot of happy people in church. I agree with you. That's my point. I'm talking about religious people needing to get the life of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about people who say they've called upon the name of the Lord and their lives have been transformed. I'm talking about them starting to think different. I'm talking about them starting to act different I'm just so that they can start living different. I'm talking, to the, I'm talking to you about understanding what God's made available to you and you latching on to it and holding on to it and laying hold on eternal life, which, which is not just a, about what's going to happen to you after you die. It's about what's happening to you right now and the proofs of it, of whether or not it's a part of your life is evidence now. And if it's not going on in your life, like it should be, then don't despair. Cry out to God. He will hear you and answer and he'll establish these things. I mean, you know, if I was pointing out all the bad stuff and telling you where you're messing up and didn't give you a remedy and didn't give you a solution, you'd have a right to walk out of here going, that just isn't fair. And I agree with you. I'd get a placard too. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. But I'm giving you the solution. I'm giving you the remedy. We watched as we watched over the past couple of weeks as one worship group came up after another, and it, you know just commented to. Sometimes I'd, I'd say to Ann, "Boy, I'm glad that's over." <laughs> other times I go, "Wow, somebody stepped into the glory." Because it ain't about vocal cords; it's about an anointing. It's about a manifest presence of Jesus. It's about a realm, huh? Oh my goodness! And it's that way. And those are things that maybe are bigger on a bigger scale because they're on stage. But each one of us. Each one of us are supposed to be the carriers of the life of God. And somebody said, well, if you knew the man I was living with, you'd understand. <laughs> no. You got the wrong man. You focused on the wrong man, in other words. You need to be focused on the man, Christ Jesus. Yes. Huh? Somebody said, somebody said, if you understood the woman, huh, am I, that I have to put up with on a daily basis, you would recognize, my goodness, some people are going to be sad. One person came to me and said, I'm not coming to church anymore, here anymore. You guys are unreasonable, and I believe that you're a cult. I said, oh, really? I said, why? Because you expect people to be happy all the time. <laughs> the cult of happiness. <laughs> the cult of happiness. Give me a break. I mean, how many times the Lord? How many times did the Lord talk about joy? How many times has the Father described to us, "Rejoice evermore"? Huh. You know, and some people, you can have to just give some people a break. They're going to be overly joyful here because this is the only time they're joyful all week. I'm going to say it again. You're going to have to just give grace for some people to be joyful here because this time I'm not the joyful all week. The rest of the time, you ought to listen to them because we put microphones on them and hit them away. We got hidden cameras. People say, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Not really. We, we do have microphones and hidden cameras because it's the word of knowledge. It's a discerning of spirits. Father sees everything and he lets us know what goes on those secret chamber he reveals to us. You know, I said one time, I said, guys, I know where you're going on your computers. We've de there has been a special uh, um, application developed that allows us to track where everybody goes and then signals us when you're on the wrong site so we can visit with it with you there at the same time. Flashing neon warnings. Sent that out to all the preachers and pastors and leaders of the churches kind of thing, you know? And everybody who goes to church. And they're like, my God, man. <laughs> Pastor Mark has this application. <laughs> and he's able to see where everybody's at. So I had to let everybody realize. I had to help everybody understand. Wait, wait, wait. The application is fully spiritual. I hope it's not less impactive to you now. I hope it doesn't, I hope it doesn't have as much, I hope it has as much rather impact upon you 
to check you. Huh? Because it's far more, it's far more impactive what God knows more than what man knows. But when God becomes more real to you than men, yes. now what you can do? God's more real to me than men. God's more real to me and what he's doing than governments. And all the various different things around us that we believe we know and understand. Father's got the inside reality behind what's behind the origin of everything that is happening and behind the motive of everything that is happening. He alone can define for us what's really going on. Huh? He alone helps us to see when somebody's trying to be a deceiver. There's a lot of them. When somebody's trying to rip us off, steal something from us, deprive us of something, coerce us into agreeing with something that ultimately is going to be bad for ourselves and everyone else. You know, I love these commercials. If you were, uh, if you were a victim of the last medical breakthrough, and you had this procedure, call us right now because there's a multi-million dollar lawsuit and you more than likely <laughs> can get some of the money to compensate your pain and misery. <laughs> that's why I have more confidence in God than man. Once again, that's why I believe God more than man. That's why I believe in God more than I believe in the person of man. I want you to just understand. All that stuff is who knows what's coming out of a, whether what's coming out of a person's mouth is true or not. That's why the Lord said, unless they speak according to this word, there is no truth in them. There's no line in them. And so we've seen so many people, politicians included, take up into their mouth the verses of Scripture and try to basically poise themselves on the high ground of the Word of God to get people to vote for them, to get people to go along with their ideas. Not only them, but people on a daily basis. Quoting Scripture to try to get folks to go along with their ideas. Come on, man. It's time to seek the Lord. It's time to grab a hold of the life of God. Not just to have knowledge about Him, but to have His life. To be hungry and thirsty after righteousness. To be hungry and thirsty for the kingdom of God. I can tell you whether or not you've been born again. Are you living continually in an expectation for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ because you want him to come and rule and reign and you ready for your return of your master? If that's not a reality in your life, there's a problem with your heart. There's a problem with your salvation because salvation results in you having the same kind of heart that Father has. You having the same kind of heart that Christ Jesus has. You having the same desires and expectations that the Holy Spirit has. It means that you are a part of a family. You've been brought into oneness. I was talking to a, a UPC guy the other night and, um, you know, just blessing on him because, you know, I know Bartleman started the UPC United Pentecostal Church and, you know, and... And, and God's done many things to the United Pentecostal Church. People don't know this, but, you know, not, you know, there's a lot of famous people that have impacted the church. Um, for example, Brandon was UPC, United Pentecostal. And, you know, and he's saying, you know, I said to him, I looked at him and just, we were just, you know, blessing him and spending some time talking with him, ministering to him. And, and I said, you know, I said, really, if, you, if we really want to grab a hold of oneness, let's grab a hold of John chapter 17, verse 21 through 23, and recognize the Father's given us the opportunity to be one, just like he's one with Christ Jesus. Just like Jesus is one with the Father, he's given us the same opportunity to be one with the Father. Just as the Father's in him, he's in us. And that UPC pastor just lit up. He said, man, that's it. I'm telling you, that's the only way I'm going. That's really what's in my heart. As I was, t as I was talking to him and he's describing these things to me, I knew this guy, he, was, he wasn't about his doctrinal opinions and his doctrinal ideas. It wasn't about his dogma, his, his various different persuasion of what he believes the Word of God says. There was the very heart and the life of the Word of God being expressed from, from, his, from, his, from his desire, from his, from his demeanor. He wasn't trying to uphold, you know, his ideas of superior to others. People, we're just looking for the life of Jesus Christ. That's all. We want to give you witness that the life of Jesus Christ is in you. We go to the third world countries and we make an altar call and thousands and tens of thousands of people will come to, come to the altar. We're getting ready to go to Mongolia. Mongolia is under the, the governmental administration of China. But Mongolia is about to be free again. We go to Mongolia. Thousands and tens of thousands of people will respond to the message of salvation without any persuasion, hardly at all. The power of God will just come. And all we we'll talk about is Jesus and his love for them. And they'll come. 
in the United States of America, people are imprisoned by religion. They're imprisoned by the Christian religion, not Buddhist religion, not Hindu religion. See, when a person is imprisoned by Hindu religion or in, in some other religion, it's much easier to break through, but when people already believe that they're Christians and already right with God, they're in the prison, they cannot hear. They cannot hear, there's a mental block. It's like trying to help, some, help somebody with this basic principles of algebra that really did not advance beyond fractions, and they can't get it because it's under the title algebra. And somebody told them they can't do math. It's a mental block. <laughs> you can show them all day long, it's, just, it's no different. It's a, mental block. it's a mental block in the churches of America and Europe. There's a mental block. There's a veil over the eyes. There's scales on. Today, I'm here to set you free. The good news is I'm here to break the mental block. To hear the good news is I'm here to remove the scales. Hallelujah. The good news is we got the answer. Praise God. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. We're not telling you that you've got to send us money and we're going to send you some special thing that we created. We've got this new book that we've just released that will give you all your answers. We're here to tell you, open up your Bible. God's Word hasn't changed. We're here to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ to speak to you nothing other. There's not, nothing original here, folks. Just one disclaimer, nothing original here. I don't have anything copyrighted. It's all public domain. It's come to us right out of the Word of God. It's right there contained within the Holy Scriptures. <clears throat> you have the right and absolutely the command to go prove whether what I am saying is true or false. You don't have to get busy because I'm spending six to eight hours a day and have been most of my life. Are you with me? In the Word of God. So you're going to have to get real busy. And by the way, you're going to have to go ahead and learn Hebrew and Greek as well because you're going to have to understand that you're going to have to uh, develop your arguments from the original language, not from a translation, not from Spanish or English. Okay, with me? Okay, and I want you to do that. And we welcome everybody's concerns and we welcome everybody's comments and thoughts. We want to hear them. I mean, we're open-hearted and objective. Everybody's got a voice, but God's Word wins the argument. His proofs set forth are absolutely invincible. The high tower. Hallelujah. His name is a high tower. And His Word is a high tower. The righteous run in. The unrighteous sit out there and want to talk about it and argue. The name of the Lord is a high tower. The righteous run in and they're saved. I want, I'm inviting you to come in and stay. We're inviting you to have a change of heart and live in the change of heart. We're inviting you to be set free from the tyrannical reign of demon spirits and now come under the reign of Christ Jesus to now, instead of being mentored by a demon spirit, how to be more and more wrong and more and more wicked and more and more set in whatever addiction or problem you may face, we're asking you right now to come receive the free gift of salvation and allow God the Holy Ghost now to be your teacher, your mentor, your guide, your instructor, your comforter, your companion, the one who shows you and leads you in all the ways of life. Everybody, everybody has to choose. Somebody says, I disagree with you. That's fine, you can disagree with me. I mean, goodness, no problem. But are you disagreeing with God? Because now you've got yourself a problem. And you better know for certain where you stand today. I'm asking you today, do you have the life of Jesus Christ? Is it precious to you? I'm asking you, do you have the evidence and the proof that you have the life of Jesus Christ? Because it's not subjective. There is scripture after scripture, evidence after evidence that clearly defines for men whether or not they have the life of Christ or whether they've been deceived because God wants no one to be deceived. Religion will deceive you. And I don't care what kind of religion it is. It will deceive you. If Satan can't keep you back from the knowledge of Jesus Christ, he's going to do everything he possibly can do to hold you into a, some, get you into a religious prison quickly. There's I don't care if you're a Roman Catholic or a Pentecostal. Deception is in religion. I don't care if you're a Lutheran or a Baptist. There's deception in religion. Somebody said, well, how, my goodness, you got me all spooked now. What am I, how am I going to know the difference? The Word of God. The Word of God. Well, it's open for interpretation. No, it's not. If you think so, let's play Bible trivia because I like to win at games. <laughs> every, every question in Bible trivia, well, it's open for interpretation. No, oh, turn, look on the back. There's one answer. <laughs> the rest of the Bible is the same way. Who was the mother of Jesus? Sally's wrong answer. 
How many stones did David have when he went and met uh, Caleb? Wrong question. <laughs> False question. How many stones did David have when he went and met Goliath? Huh? That's right. If you say two, wrong. <laughs> no, it was my interpretation because I believe that five in the original language actually means two. <laughs> that ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. Satan's lies, I ruin them. I smash them right now. It ain't going to work. It will not work in the classroom, in any education or academic world, uh, realm, and it won't work in the church of Jesus Christ or in any realm of the things of the Spirit. Lies. There's a right answer, there's a wrong answer. It's time for everybody to begin to deal with the reality of who they are and where their walk is with Jesus Christ. The evidence and the proofs have been set forth. We in perilous times, people. You're in perilous times. And I just want to, I want to close by saying, what, what are you going to give in exchange for your soul? Some people are consciously selling their soul to the devil. Other people are unconsciously selling their souls to the devil. What will you give in exchange for your soul? What does it profit you if you gain the whole world? I mean, there are some people that literally have gained, as it were, all the wealth that there is to have in this world. And the fame and the power that goes with it. They sold out big. What'd you sell for? Esau sold for a bowl of beans. Because his stomach placed too big a demands upon him, bigger than his own will and his own consecration was able to meet. Stomach, bigger than will. Wild, isn't it, when you think about it? What do you sell for? What have you sold for? What are you willing to sell for? How many of you people want to know? You want to know the truth. You want to be certain. You really want to know what's going on. Then what you're going to do is you're going to get down. You're going to first and foremost listen because God has made this very simple. He has not made this complicated. He said, here I am. Jesus said, here I am. Walk this way. This is the light that pleases God. This is it. And the only way you can have this life is you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. And it's a real genuine change. Sometimes I deal with people and I ask them, have you been born again? Have you been saved? They say, yes, I have. I say, then do you mean that you've received a new heart different from the one you were born with? A new spirit different from the one you were born with? And that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God Himself, has now come and dwells on the inside of you and by nature produces within you all the, those things that belong to God's own desire and heart and, it's, and if they can say yes to that then I'm saying amen that's exactly what the Bible says but a lot of people believe that they are saved because they were sprinkled with a few drops of special water when they were a baby or because so when they responded to some altar call in a big meeting and it was a famous person said you're saved no 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 did you get a change do you line up with what God describes and defines a saved person to be that's the question I'm presenting to you. That's the issue that you must deal with. That is the most important, that is the most important subject of your life. Not how much you're going to get when you retire, not how much money you have in the bank, not what's going to happen to you if there is, if there is financial collapse. That's going to be pretty evident. You don't need to think too long about that. You probably won't think that way because people don't like pain and they don't want to deal with uncertainty. But when you come over here and you begin to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know that a thousand will fall by your side, ten thousand by your right hand won't come nigh you. You don't, you don't have insecurities. You are very secure. You're not worried about things, un, you know, unraveling because whether you're here or there with Him, you're living in His presence. Right. So dying is no problem for you, so you don't worry about dying. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Dear people, we need to go to prayer. I need people to go to prayer. I need people to go to worship with me. I need people who are anointed of the Holy Ghost. And, and if you're not anointed of the Holy Ghost, you want to be. Because all you got to do is want to be, and it ain't going to take long, and you're going to step into a glory realm. Hallelujah. I got anointed of the Holy Ghost, and it wasn't because I went to a special meeting, and it wasn't because I was laid, somebody laid hands on me with a special anointing. I got anointed of the Holy Ghost because I went to Jesus Christ on my heart, crying out on my face, Oh, God, I must know you. And it doesn't matter whether you're in San Diego or in the backwoods of 
of the jungle somewhere, you'll get the same results. And, it, and that move of God and that encounter with God changed everything about my life. And God wants to change your life. And I'm asking you, what are you going to sell out for? Some people are selling out for some cheap tricks. Some people are just selling out because they want it their way and they want to win every argument. Some people, what are you selling out for? Some people are selling out just because they don't want to see, they don't want to be looked at as being radical or whatever. I don't know. What are you selling out for? Some people sell out for the cheap, cheap thrill of sexuality, the cheap thrill of a high from some kind of a drug or opiate, some kind of a poison. We'd be arguing with me, telling me marijuana, what God created, it's got to be good and all this medical stuff. I said, the oleander's pretty beautiful too, why don't you chew on that? <laughs> I said, we have, we have something that's called water hemlock. It's a pretty plant. It's a very pretty plant. Water hemlock is pretty. How many of you have seen water hemlock? Don't handle it. You'll die. It's very poisonous. Don't eat it. <laughs> One guy was saying, yeah, you know what was over there? <clears throat> Fixing tractor and all of a sudden somebody came running and said, cows are falling over dead right and left. I know they got the cows quickly out of the area, shut them out, started looking around. Yeah, they started eating that hemlock. It didn't take long for the cows. Big old cows. Big old cows. I'm talking about 15, 1,600 pound cows. Just chewing on a little bit of it. Takes them out. What, you know, come on. It's poison. God created that. <laughs> I would advise you not to touch it. There's all kinds of things, weeds and thorns and things that have come up because of the spiritual condition. There's a lot of things in the physical world that is a result and reflection of the spiritual condition of men, the spiritual choices of men. What's going on right now, socially, politically, what's going on in the world today, the chaos. I'm going to tell you right now, Putin wants to fight. If you don't think he doesn't want to fight, you know nothing about the Russian mentality of where he comes from. He wants to fight. He's picking a fight. He's picking a fight. And I'm just blessed that people sitting in Washington are holding some kind of sensible res, you know, restraint. Listen to me, people. There's a lot of folks that care nothing about their life, their causes, everything for them. And we're sitting around, we all want to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And it, it'll all be better soon. P world peace. There's a lot of folks who want to capitalize on that. That's exactly what Satan does. He comes as a man of peace. That's what he's done to you personally in various different ways. Here today, I'm calling you out one more time. Would you like the life of Jesus? Yes. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, the life of Jesus is not only a miracle encounter of God because you're true and sincere with your heart, but it's a commitment every day. Not only is it a commitment every day, huh? it's a response to the spirit of grace that's going to make you hungry and thirsty for more reality because God's not going to force feed anybody. Every, every decision you make is a decision of whether you're really saying from your heart whether or not you want to walk with God or whether you want more, want more from the Lord. And, and I'm, I pray in Jesus' name that every one of you today will respond to the voice of the Lord. You're either deciding, you're sowing seeds of some sort every single day. You're either sowing seeds to the flesh which will wreak destruction for you. You listen to me. Sowing seeds to the flesh reaps a whirlwind of destruction for you every day. Every day, you're sowing. And sin will make your, sin will, the working of the deceitfulness of sin will make you so hard that you will not be able to respond. You won't be tender towards the Lord. Every day, you're sowing seed. Or you're sowing seed to the Spirit and reaping everlasting life, the benefits of just knowing God and being, being that much more sensitive to His presence and that much more willing to be obedient and that much more tender heart, a proper yes. child. It's great to be around proper kids. I raised a house full of proper kids. We used to have waitresses come up to us. I'm not kidding, more than once. Several different, different occasions. Say, listen, we want to pay people, uh, either the management or the people wanted to pay. And this was before it was a thing for advertisement. This is long ago. We, we just want to take care of, of your food today because your kids are just amazing. They have proper kids, They're proper children. Proper children because they were loved on a lot because mom and I loved on each other in front of them and loved on them. Amen. Love makes people proper. There's a lot of discipline in love. There's a lot of order in love. Hmm? I'm going to say that to make a point. Are you a proper child in the kingdom of God? Or are you a brat? 
Are you the kind of person? Now think about it. You know, come on, people. The older you get, at least you want to be around little brats. I'm sorry if I'm with anybody. But it just, it's a commonality. I know everybody can say amen if you was really honest. You know, you, know, you, you don't really interested in sitting down eating while the little kid comes and puts his fingers right in the food you're about to take. Huh? Or screaming and hollering at his mom. You're like, can I leave now? Right? Are you an obedient child in the kingdom of God? Or are you disobedient? Are you a proper child in the kingdom of God? Today, you might be a disobedient, improper brat in the kingdom of God, but Father still loves you. He's devoted to you. Now you've got to be as willing to change. Everybody stand with me. All you have to be as willing to change. People, let me just say this. Let me say this to you. Every great move of God, every great move of God, every great move of God came at the expense of somebody being willing to consecrate them life, life to doing what's right. Come on. Not doing what's right by you or doing what's right by me, but doing what's right by God. I don't need anybody to tell me why my parents, my ancestors rather, came here from England and from Holland. I know why they came here. I don't need anybody to rewrite our family history. I know what went on in this nation in the early 1600s. We know what went on in the, in the foundation and the formation of our country in the Great Awakening of the 1700s. We know what, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an accident that Charles Finney was on the scene right alongside of Andrew Jackson. He's probably one of the great presidents of the United States of America, removed the National Bank so that money couldn't control politics. Huh? Opened up the right for more people to participate, and on and on and on. There was a revival, a refining revival that went on. We believe in God for another great awakening. Listen, we believe in God. We believe in God that the moving of His Spirit will find free course among us. Otherwise, that, that awakening will not come. There were men who consecrated themselves to it. George Whitfield, while at Oxford, consecrated himself to living only and solely for God, not to the pursuit of his own wealth or personal gain. Most all of the early formers of our country were preachers. They were preachers. Hello? They had no religious affiliation. They, they, the person that said that on TV knew they were lying, but they have no problem lying. People are just generous enough to believe that folks are trying to try to tell the truth. It's just not true, people. The majority of the formers of our nation were preachers who were willing to put everything on the line that nobody could come and dictate to us what we were going to do with our finances. My ancestors were Quakers. Nobody was going to tell them to pay tithe. Even though the Boston, Mass the Massachusetts colony demanded the way, that's the way they raised taxes, you pay tithe. That's how our country started. Nobody could tell me that it didn't start that way because my great, 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 great aunt was hung in the Boston House of Commons. It's the first American martyr because she didn't pay tithe. She didn't believe it. Quakers don't believe it. And plus, she was a little radical when it came to miracles. And, and, and the people in the Boston House of Commons were Puritans. And they didn't believe in miracles. They were cessationists and believed the gifts of the Spirit were for today. And so they just coined her a witch. Hunger. We know, what, we know how this nation is. We, we got blood in this. We got blood, we got blood in the formation. We got blood in every war. We got blood in this. Bigger than this, we got vision. We got a heavenly vision. Amen. God raised us up as a light unto the nations here in this nation because of the church. A friend of mine, professor of economics, University of Beijing, as a consultant, counsel for Hughes Cabinet, came to the United States of America in 2001 to do an investigation of what was behind the basis of the economic success of American Europe. His conclusion was the authority and the power and the influence of the Church of Jesus Christ. He said that, Hughes Cabinet literally said to them, well, should we just mandate that everybody become Christians? 
He said, you can't do it that way. One French, one French um, philosopher, I, I can't remember exactly what his name was, but came to the United States of America looking what was the basis. This is back in the, in the uh, 1800s. What was the basis for America's quick rise to success? He said, I didn't find it in the streams, nor in the forests, nor in their great entrepreneurship. And the list goes on. I found it in the strength of their churches. Now then, people want to take that away from us and say that we got to be like the Hindus and we got to accommodate the Hindus and the Buddhists. Look, go ahead, Hindus, do whatever you want. But I'm not going to quit being, America can't be quit being what we are just because we opened our arms in compassion and benevolence to you to come. Enjoy, but we're going to still preach Jesus. We're going to still hold out the moral uh, laws and ethics of the Word of God. We're going to demand truth and righteousness and purity and humility. And, come on. It's these things. Have, have, there, there's not going to be a revival of it until the church rises up. There's not going to be a revival of it until the church rises up. There's not going to be, I said, there's not going to be a revival of it until the church rises up. And the church isn't going to rise up until you decide whether or not you're going to sell out your life for Jesus. Or whether you're going to try to hold on to your life and the life of Jesus. Here's what I've discovered. Those who hold on to their life have never truly understood or met the life of Jesus. Because once you have his life, you don't want your own life. And I'm just going to persuade you. I want to persuade you. I've got just a few more minutes. I just want to persuade you. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, how much you know you, you know about yourself or know about God, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm asking you today to sell out to God and 100% invite God to take full control of your life. He doesn't want just your life as it was when you were born of your parents. He wants you to have a new life. He wants to give you his life, the life of God. That's the only life that can connect with him. Let me put it, let me put it this way, okay? Because this has become more visible and that this is, does not cast any kind of condemnation on any single person or group. Right now, there's gangs coming over from the cartel that have been immersed in Central and South America in gang violence. Okay? Some of them are 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. They murdered their first person when they were five or six years of age. Okay? Listen to me. Okay? You can't relate to them. You can, in your compassion, bring them on into your house, but they messed up. You don't kill that many people per year and do that many acts of violence and mutilate people and chop people up and do the things that they've had to go through since they were little kids and be right. You've seen too much stuff, been down too many roads. How are you going to relate to them? I'm going to tell you right now, a person has not been changed by the, by the power that is in the name of Jesus Christ by the miracle of salvation, cannot relate to God any more than that gang homie person from the cartel could relate to you, nor you to him, nor God to you. You listening to me? Because this is what Papa says. He makes it very, very clear that the change of heart and life and nature is essential. What we do is the life of Jesus. I pray that today you'll accept the life of Jesus Christ as the free gift of salvation. And truly, the gift of salvation, gift of deliverance, the gift of rescue. I, don't, I see people get caught in semantics all the time. Redefinition of words. Salvation means you were delivered. What were you delivered from? You were rescued from something. From what? Jesus said, I've come to deliver you, to rescue you, to unlock the prison doors, to break off the bonds of sin and death that held you under its power so that you no longer walk out a life dictated to you by everything that is evil and warped. So when you say you're saved, tell you're telling me you were delivered from the prison of sin and death and demonic power controlling your life. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, right now, in the name of Jesus, 
Everyone who's willing in this place, I tell you, Christ Jesus comes, He liberates you, He sets you free. There's no reason for you to ever have condemnation again. There's no reason for you to live in guilt. There's no reason for you to live in shame. There's no reason for you to live in doubt and in pain. There's too many condemned, guilty, shameful Christians. That's why they're unhappy. We want you to be set free in Jesus' name to now begin to live this free gift of salvation, the life of God. Today, I'm not only stopping there, I'm asking people to sell out, to consecrate your lives, to so live for the purposes of the gospel, that through you, God might affect a change in this nation. That the anointing will so freely flow through your life that when you begin to pray, the atmosphere changes. When you walk up and you talk to somebody, they got to go repent because they're so overwhelmed by Holy Ghost conviction because the anointing and presence of God is so strong upon your life. Hallelujah. That everywhere you go, people recognize the anointing, the favor of God upon your life that know about the anointing and favor of God. There should be not one single person in this place that refuses to accept the grace and the goodness of God, His mercy. People want to blame God. Well, if God was a loving God, He wouldn't send people to earth. Hell, God is a loving God, and He's made a way for you to escape hell. Now, let's turn this thing around. God is a loving God, and He's made a way for you to escape hell. Now, let's turn this thing around. Now, you can't forget about the anarchy. Look, let's just turn the thing around. Huh? Yeah, well, if God is loving. No, He is the loving God. Don't if. Get rid of the if. He is loving God, and He's so loving that He made a way for you to escape, to escape eternal damnation. Hallelujah. God is a loving God. He's made a way of escape for you and I. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Today, calling upon the name of the Lord is so simple. You invite Jesus Christ to come into your life. Literally. You in, listen, literally. Not figuratively. Literally. You invite the person, Jesus Christ, to come into your life. Now listen. He, if you're honest and sincere, He comes in. Wow, that's receiving the life of God. And then God now just stepped into your life. Think about the change. Think about the change that's going to take place when God steps into your life. How hard is it? It isn't any more difficult than that. He made it really simple. I mean, think about it. The, man, the, 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 the thief hanging on the cross alongside Jesus. All he was willing to do is recognize that Jesus was who he said he was and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom and God's mercy and love and grace is so good. He said to him, this day you will be with me in paradise. You will be with me this day in the realms of the heavenly. Wow, my Dear people, somebody said, ah, oh, but yeah, you know, and then he had to die and he didn't have to go through all the stuff I'm going through. No, 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 no. He missed out on the better and the better and the greater opportunities that you and I have right now where we get to live great for God, where we get to come into a relationship with him that goes beyond those things that would ever be able to be experienced in any other realm. Angels can't experience what we can be experiencing right now. The thief that died on the cross will never know the opportunities of the things in God that you and I who are going through this great tribulation right now and this great opposition and being able by the power of God to stand against all sin and iniquity and every influence of the enemy overcoming him at every point are allowed to enjoy as we've been prepared to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. I want you to think about it, dear people. I'm telling you, this is a cause worth it all. You say, Jesus, come into my life and he'll step in. Woo! God steps in. Ha ha! Zonda that says hello here on mine. <laughs> All heavens mobilize for your part. He'll take care of you. He'll protect you. He'll be your protector. He'll be your perfecter. He'll be your provider. You'll have nothing to worry about for the rest of your life. Come and enjoy this comfort in the Holy Ghost. I mean, it just keeps getting better. This is the life of God. This is the good life. When, when Father introduced himself and revealed himself, he said, I am merciful, I am gracious, I am compassionate, I am full of covenant love and faithfulness. 
this is it's just, just God. Phew. Now in Jesus' name, I set every person free in this place. Everyone who has under the has been under the yoke of Satan, I break off that yoke. I smash it. In the name of Jesus, I break off in every area and dimension strongholds and influences of demonic power. They have to obey me and listen and go. In Jesus' name, harassing them more. Now, in the name of Jesus, I speak into your spirit. Strength. Be strong now. Be strong now in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might. Amen. From this day forward, you empowered to fully live for Jesus. Thank you, living God. We want to invite you to worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings. It's a big part of worship. It's always been a part of worship. Father's promise to multiply provision to you, miraculous provision. Father just takes us from faith to faith. We want you to be a part of that blessing in every area. God doesn't just want you to be blessed spiritually and physically. He wants you to be blessed financially. So that even if there, nobody has any food, even if there's no food, you can be a supply of supernatural provision and food, not only for your own family, but for people around you. Those days are fast approaching upon us. We want everybody to involve themselves in the miracle ministry of Jesus. So we want you to come and give. And if you want prayer for any reason, if you want prayer for any reason, if there's anybody in this place, this, this morning, you've dedicated your life to the Lord Jesus and you want us to pray with you and for you. We're going to do that. If there's anybody in this place right now, you just called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. You've never done that before and you believe that a miracle has taken place in your life. We want you to come. Or, or even if you don't know, you just, you're still believing. Once you come, we'll pray with you and for you. God will touch you. If you need physical healing in your body, if you're sick in your body, if you have any kind of disease in your body, we want you to come. I want you to come. The Lord will touch you. He will heal you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.